for all your pastry, bakery and quality food, CK restaurant is the only place to be. We do catering for birthdays, weddings and all related services. We have all kinds of local foods, American, European and even beyond. Come and have a taste of our local juice, ebe and other services. At CK Restaurant, customer satisfaction is our priority. of owning your dream homes. EJ Investment is here for you. Secure our quality bungalows with two, three, or four bedrooms or our story buildings, three or four to five bedrooms at very affordable prices with flexible payment plans at our Sanyang Sea View Estate where you can enjoy the cool breeze with modern infrastructure such as the roads, covered drainage system, modern electrification with street lights, gated entrance with security posts, and social amenities such as gas station, shopping mall, medical clinic, park, school, children daycare, and a lot more. Our dedicated team of professionals will keep the estate clean at all times, provide security and patrol team within the estate premises, install latest technologies such as CCTV, Wi-Fi, home network installation, solar panel, and power backup system. Also, check out for our additional home facilities and interior design service, such as premium tiling, wall plaster, home landscape, fingerprint home lock, and a lot more. Visit our office at Senegambia Kololi Highway and get a free site visit tour or contact us on 4464-838. WhatsApp us on 3259-220. Or you can visit our Facebook page or Instagram on EJ Investments. EJ Investments, we are first in properties. When we touch down, but I broke down. Gamtel G Fiber, now you can enjoy super fast internet in gigabytes. G Fiber is affordable, stable, secured, and accessible to homes, businesses, and enterprises. With Gamtel G Fiber, the future is speed. Gamtel, creating a brighter future in communication. Et Kadi sa vala on pitade ko webi et Google account ma on joni ndata ton wada download app ma be on ayay kala ko humpi maye ma be ton 
Ebe bi amai. Ka won ta woy aduna on kala ko wawda. A jon nana e won do kaleji men gambia do depense. Hara no wedi amai. Si duno fono ne bi. Hmm. Kimmo den joni mi do ta maka place mabbe jan. Waden joni. Iya heba ko fala. Waden ki sam. Welcome to this very important occasion. Um, it's a public lecture that is organized by the Department of Diplomacy and International um, Relations. Um, for this occasion, I'll be the master of ceremony, and I think a good number of you would already know me. I am Mr. Dawo, I am a lecturer at the Department of Diplomacy and International Relations. Um, for the program today, um, this is going to be the sequence of the activities. Um, in the beginning, we will have um, an opening prayers that will be led by a Muslim as well as a, a Christian. And then we will have the welcoming remarks to be given by the Public Relations Officer of the Management Development Institute, uh, Mr. Fai. And then we will have um, the Head of the Department of Diplomacy and International Relations, Madam Puranda Jai, to speak on the importance of the occasions, um, thereafter, we will um, head directly to the main activity, which would be the public lecture itself. But then I will do an introduction of our guest before we will get to that particular part. And then thereafter, we will have um, a vote of thanks to be given by a student on behalf of um, those that are attending this particular course. And after that, finally, we will have certificate presentation, and that will do it for, for the day. All right. Um, before we start, I would like to recognize the presence of staff of the Management Development Institute. Um, the, the registrar is here with us, Mr. Joe. Mr. Fai, the Public Relations Officer, is also here with us. Um, our Director of Human Resources, uh, Madam Supergay, is also here with us. I'd also like to recognize the presence of Prof. Fane, uh, who is being a long-term friend of the Management Development Institute and is always at every particular event that the MBI um, organizes. I'd also like to recognize the presence of all staff of the Management Development Institute, and as well as the students that have made this particular day um, a success. I'd also like to recognize the presence of MBI's twin partner from Senegal, Sobdeko, Mr. Fai is here with us. Um, so moving on, we're going straight to, to have the opening prayers. And I would like uh, Prof. to lead us in the Muslim prayers. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Rahmanir Rahim Maliki Yawmideen. Iyaka Nahbudu wa Iyaka Nastaheen. Ihdina Sirat al-Mustaheema. Sirat al-Lazina anhum ta'alihim. Khairil Mahdubi alihim wa ladhalin. Let Allah ask our prayers during the month of Ramadan. And did all our sins. And I pray that we have a special deliberation today. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Prof. Fanny. Uh, like I said, he will be on the stars today. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, to lead us in the Christian prayers, I would like to call on the attention of Mr. Clifford to lead us in the Christian prayers. Mr. Clifford, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning in reverence and obedience. We thank you for this day because you made this day um, a wonderful day. You said in the world that everything that you've done is beautiful in the sight. As we're about to have this um, short meeting, we pray that you guide our thoughts, you guide our action, you guide the deliberations. May it be meaningful to us as we go on, and may we be able to learn and understand um, the, the purpose why we're here. We understand the, mean, the meaningfulness and the usefulness of the UN system. Guide all that we do, in your love, sake, I pray. Amen. Thank you very much, Mr. Clifford. You're caught by surprise, but essentially, <laughs> prayers is, I, I think it's a normal routine, so <laughs> it's always okay. Um, next on the agenda, we will have the Public Relations Officer of the Management Development Institute to make um, some remarks 
on generally on behalf of the, the Management Development Institute. Mr. Fai, over to you, please. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Abbas Dabo of the Diplomacy and International uh, Relations Department. Um, my task this morning is uh, uh, a simple one, uh, but very, very important in the annals of the history of the Management Development Institute. Um, I want to recognize the presence of uh, uh, Mr. Salifu Joe, Registrar, uh, Diplomacy, Head of Department, Madam Kuroi of course, our erudite and esteemed guest on this very historic and very vital day, uh, the Council SIM for the TRLC. And uh, of course, Madam Super J. HR. Uh, so they call them up with uh, prof and uh, other MDI staff, UTG staff, MDI students. And uh, of course, taking into consideration other invited guests who are here. Uh, the media, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols respectfully observed. I just want to say that we have in our midst a very important individual, a very important personality uh, of our great nation, who is an illustrious son of the soil here, who has dedicated his life in defending human rights across the globe, not only in the Gambia or in Africa, but across the globe, because of his character, his professionalism, his knowledge and experience, competence, reinforced by his passion to ensure that we all live in a very free, responsible, and fair society. He has got a very rich track record of judicial experience. Um, over so many years ago, over 20 years ago, and has actually manifested that his stance on defending human rights across the globe is something that he has decided to dedicate his time on. And looking at so many things that will be said by uh, other um, um, people in this very important forum, I just want to recognize the fact that uh, our Honorable League Council has been very much instrumental in winning so many cases related to human rights violations. And even within the Africa region, be it in East Africa, amongst others, there are many. But I won't get into that because my task is all about welcoming him. But I just want to say that we are very glad, we are very happy, despite his busy schedule, with the TRLC and other engagements, he has decided to sacrifice his time, his efforts to come and share his experiences with us. And I believe it's very, very important that uh, this department has taken this initiative. I must commend the department also for taking this initiative, this innovative move in having this public lecture and having uh, our great lead council of the TRRC to give us this lecture. But um, I also want to say that the institution's um, management is also very vibrant in making sure that um, the necessary enabling environment is created to get people on board. And then whenever we have things like this, it's very, very important. So on that note, uh, allow me to welcome um, our lead council, our great guest speaker for this very important and historic occasion, uh, lead council SIM file. And uh, usually, ovations will come at the end. But my conscience will not allow me to wait till that time. So I'm urging all of us here to kindly get up and show some sign of appreciation for getting our own brother to come here and share 
his own experience with us. He's so simple and humble, I know him, but he deserves it. So please, let's have second standing ovation for SIM family, with a rousing applause. Thank you very much, you may receive your seats. Honorable Chairperson, I'm very delighted. Thank you very much. For that very inspiring, welcoming remarks on behalf of the Management Development um, Institute. Um, Mr. Fai, I, I think you have spoken about every other thing that is there to be said about, about the gentleman in our midst. But we'll, I'll still take the pleasure to formally introduce him to the rest of the audience. Um, moving on, we'd like to invite the Registrar of the Management Development Institute, Mr. Joe, to also say a word or two about the activity. Since this is an acti academic activity, it is important um, that the registry staff definitely they've been very supportive to our department in particular, the Department of Diplomacy and International Relations. And of course, without their inspirational leadership, this kind of activities would be very difficult to get it rolled out. So, Mr. Job. My name is Mr. MC. I think you came with a lot of surprises today. <laughs> um, um, honorable guest, um, I will start with the guest speaker here. Um, actually, he's a prestigious son of this country. And we say people of his caliber are owned by the whole world and not an individual country. So people like Mr. S. Andrei is too good for Gambia alone. So I will recognize his presence and I will recognize also the head of the department uh, and her staff for coming up with this wonderful initiative. I want to also recognize the thank the PRO has done a wonderful job so many years ago. And then the director of HR MDI I would also want to recognize the presence of Professor Momodu Mustafa Fane. Some people believe that he is a member of MDI. No, he is not. He is just too close to us and then he's always behind us. However, it does not matter how busy his schedule is, whenever he's informed about our activities, he is always the first person to arrive and I want to thank him for that. Uh, also, Mr. Abdul Fai, the country rep for Sobdeco University in Dakar, who are just established in the country here. Members of the MDI staff, our please uh, and our invaluable commodity, that is the students of MDI, um, the media reps and all other protocols of uh, Julia observed. I wasn't expected to be brought here, but actually um, it's a wonderful thing that my presence has been noticed. What I just want to say here is um, this is a wonderful move and uh, it's not only going to market MDI, but it's also going to inform the people about the kind of business that we do in MDI, that um, it's a public institution, and then our mandate is very crucial, that is development of critical masses for the civil service of the Gambia and the private sector and NGOs. Therefore, we cannot operate in a camera. We have to operate outside so that outsiders can also come and be, uh, know what we're going on, what is going on in MDI. Um, and this is one of the things that we invite one of the most popular Gambians now uh, to come and talk to us because he's an international figure who has gathered a lot of experience in a lot of fields in different countries of the different countries of the world. So it is important that we have him here and those who made the choice of selecting him did a very good job and I want to thank them for that. Um, and I know everybody is keen in listening to Mr. Esam by far, so I will not take longer than necessary, but join me to welcome him, like Mr. Fai said, with a long, noisy round of applause for Mr. Fai. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, um, Mr. Yu, Registrar Management Development. Institute. Um, next on the agenda, we would like to invite my very own boss. Um, the, everything you see here is as a result of uh, the team she has structured around herself. Um, if she has not been inspirational, this um, public lecture today would not be possible. All right. Um, I would like to recognize um, the president. Sorry, I would like to call my able boss, Madam Kulonda Onjai to talk to us about the importance of this particular um, event. So, Madam, um, for those who are not maybe students of Management Development Institute, Madam Pulon Damanjai is the head of the Department of Diplomacy and International Relations. Boss. 
Assalamu alaikum. Good morning. The guest speaker just stepped out, but he's coming back. Good morning to him, Mr. Esam Baifal. Um, good morning to my MDI colleagues here present, all of you, um, the UTG staff present, MDI students, UTG students, my very own in-law here present, I recognize your presence, um, the media houses, all of you here. MC, Mr. MC of the program, my very own assistant. I know we are gathered here today for a public lecture. But this public lecture wouldn't have been possible without my team. So bravo to all of you. Bravo. <laughs> bravo to the MBI management. Mr. Aliu K. Jaju, the Director General. And then, we all know the purpose of a public lecture. It is important that academic institutions organize such programs. And today, the Department of Diplomacy and International Relations of the Management Development Institute organized this one. The um, public lecture is to educate the public. And normally, when such programs are organized, it is important that you invite prominent experts in the field to come and deliver. And that is the best choice that we have taken to invite Mr. SRM Fal. Now, this public lecture is a model under the department pursued by both the peace and conflict students, likewise the diplomacy students. So the organization of the program is timely and it is very important. That is why we gathered all of them in these two sets. Likewise, all other students of the MBI because it is time for us to educate one another and also to share knowledge. That is exactly why we organize this, this um, great event. The event is historic. It is historic because such an event, this is the first time that we organize it. It is true that we have public lecture, but such a public lecture, this is the first time that we are organizing it. Now, the model is called the UN system. And this is handled by no other than the MC of the program, Mr. Abbas Dabo. And he deemed it fitting and necessary to organize and invite the expert. That is why we are gathered here today. It is part of the curriculum. And then, as part of the curriculum designed by the MVI, such should always be called for. So as a result, this is the reason why we are gathered. So we all know that it is important as an academic institution, these are some of the things that we do for everybody to know that yes, we are creating knowledge, but likewise, we are also sharing the knowledge that is being created. So on that note, I don't want to take much time of the guest speaker. I know he's already back, but we anticipate, we all anticipate a fruitful and an inspirational deliberation today by no other than Mr. S.R.M. Fall. <laughs> He's been introduced, but I'm quite sure we will do an order formal introduction just to express how we appreciate him leaving his busy schedule and every other thing that he should be doing to come to MBI and answer to our call. Mr. Esa M. Fall, on behalf of the Director General, he said I should inform you that he really appreciate you, appreciate your coming and accepting the call to come and deliver a historic, historic public lecture to both the MDI students and perhaps some of the UTG students who are here present. As I said before, all of us, we are anticipating of a very educative and fruitful 
um, public lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, boss. You've, you've said it all. And like she rightly mentioned, um, if you observe, MDI is the Civil Service College of the Gambia, and as such, we thought it important to bring in people that are really every day involved in the practice of whatever it is that we are teaching so that they can also share their knowledge. And essentially, that's going to close the gap between theory and, and practice. And that's the main reason for this um, particular activity. Next on the agenda, I'd like to officially um, introduce our guest lecturer today. Um, this is no other person than Mr. S. Afal. Our guest lecturer has extensive knowledge and experience in international criminal and international human rights law. He has started his career as a state counsel in the Ministry of Justice in the Gambia, and soon after he was posted to the Gambian Permanent Mission in the United Nations. Uh, but obviously you would know many a times it's, it would be the case. Our best are always snatched away from us by the United Nations system. And then um, in 2000, January, he was appointed as judicial officer by the United Nations, and then soon after he was deployed to the United Nations Transition Administration in East Timor. At the time, you know, after post-conflict, East Timor was in the process of post-conflict reconstruction, uh, recovery, if you would like to put it that way, and then he was deployed to, the, to, to play a very significant part in that particular uh, mission. And most importantly, they have been able to re-establish the judicial system of East Timor um, at the time. In the year 2002, he was appointed as acting deputy, um, the deputy director general of prosecution for serious crimes and later he was moved on to the post of um, chief of prosecution. In 2005, still progressing in his career, he joined the International Development Law Organization in Rome, uh, where he was responsible of designing, supervising and directing the implementation of good governance, as well as justice sector reform in developing countries around the globe. In the year 2006, our guest speaker, Mr. Fahl, was appointed in the International Criminal Court, the ICC, to head the complex investigation into the um, Davos situation. Of course, it paid dividend, and then this led to the successful um, investigation, and as well as the it also culminated into the indictment of, um, and, and as well as the issuance of arrest warrants for people that have um, violated and they have committed serious human rights violations. Essentially, we call them crimes against humanity, all right? That would essentially be senior members of the Sudanese government. And moving on within his career, he was later on, within the years 2011 to 2016, precisely in September, he, was, uh, he served as the lead, the co-lead defense counsel in the International Criminal Court in the case against um, Uhuru Kenyatta, William Bruto, General Mohammed Hussein Ali, just to name but a few. Um, later on in his career, he had also served as the defense counsel of um, Charles Taylor, the former Liberian um, president. And he has also served as the counsel for um, Saif al-Islam Gaddafi in the International Criminal Court. Um, with such extensive experience, as well as dealing with serious and mass atrocities for most of his career, in different capacities, in different countries, and in different situations. Um, he has gathered for himself extensive insight and has gained the ability to competently handle almost all human rights cases or cases that are relating to you know, genocide and massive, mass atrocities that have been committed by warlords. And like he would often say himself, prosecuting is my bread and butter. <laughs> all right. So, um, in our midst today, I invite Mr. S. R. M. Fall to deliver a lecture on the United Nations in post-conflict recovery. The reason for this invitation, again, is because of his extensive experience on the subject matter. And I think you will agree with me that he will definitely do justice to the topic that is being assigned to him. All right, but before we start, I think I'll also follow the bandwagon um, to request you to give him a standing ovation before he takes the podium. Thank you very much. You may take your seats. All 
All right, and then to the most important part of the occasion. Mr. Fall, the show is yours. Guests, uh, lecturers of the UTG and the MDI, uh, perhaps I should take. I have been instructed to take off my mask. So thank you very much. Uh, I am not my usual self, uh, so I have difficulty speaking through the mask. Uh, if this invitation wasn't so important, I would not have showed up anywhere today uh, because of my current condition. Uh, but, but because it's so important, I just have to come. I could not afford to disappoint this big crowd uh, of, of, of thirsty uh, uh, young individuals, thirsty for knowledge. Uh, so, so I just had to come and, and grace this occasion. Thank you, the organizers and the students of this institution for giving me the opportunity to come and address you uh, about a very important topic, uh, the issue of the United Nations and post-conflict recovery. Why is it interesting for me is that I am given the opportunity to share my experiences with you uh, on something that really affects humanity at large. Uh, I had the great fortune to work at the United Nations Security Council where I participated at various levels in the negotiation, in the crafting of resolutions that would eventually lead to the deployment of United Nations peacekeeping troops around the world. I have had first-hand experience of some of the considerations that underlined some of these decisions. I have also worked in East Timor, where I had the good fortune to be a United Nations staff in a, with a very unique mandate uh, that is a transitional administration mandate wherein the UN was essentially the government of the new country that was born uh, in 1999. And the UN being the government, we had to build institutions from scratch. Uh, that was a very interesting experience uh, because it exposed us to post-conflict uh, peace building. It exposed us to uh, recovery of a country from the brink of war. I have also worked with the International Development Law Organization based in Rome, where I had to travel around the world to design uh, and implement justice sector reform programs to help countries that are emerging out of conflict, uh, in particular uh, in Liberia uh, and in Afghanistan. I have also worked at the International Criminal Court at the Office of the Prosecutor, uh, where we had to take certain interventions uh, that affected countries that were in conflict or emerging out of conflict. Uh, and that is the justice end of things, like right? investigating and prosecuting human rights violations. Uh, I have also worked as a defense counsel at the ICC, where I have experienced firsthand the impact of the decisions that are made with regards to those countries or some of these countries that are emerging out of conflict. I, however, must admit that this topic is very broad. It is a big, it's a giant topic. And I think my experiences are so limited to do justice to it. But I would share it nonetheless. I'll share my experiences nonetheless. But I just want to uh, 
uh, cancel uh, these institutions. Uh, to look to Dr. Sise, uh, Dr. Lamin Sise of the TRRC, the chairman, who's had almost 50 years of experience working in this field at the United Nations. And working at the office of the Secretary General, being the person who was always next to the Secretary General, he certainly had much more experience than I possibly could ever have. Uh, and he would have been the ideal person uh, for this topic. Uh, but nonetheless, invite him someday and let him give you grandfather's stories about the experiences he has had. Uh, you know, some of the things that you would never find written in any book. And I think that would enrich your appreciation of diplomacy. He certainly has in, to his fingertips all the intricacies that are involved, all the crazy things that go on uh, behind the scenes when things are negotiated. Uh, I, and I am sure uh, that with his presence here, your knowledge of that topic would certainly be enriched. Uh, but that said, I would still thank the organizers for thinking me worthy uh, to deliver uh, such a lecture. Conflict, in particular armed conflict, has bedeviled the world since time immemorial. Mankind had always looked for ways to deal with prevention or management of conflict, or the restoration of peace and consolidation of peace gains and post-conflict recovery. The very history of the United Nations typifies this quest by mankind to deal with the problem of managing and ending armed conflicts and ensuring durable post-conflict recovery. After World War I, an international group brought about the League of Nations to address disputes between nations. The initiative failed. Undeterred, after World War II, an international organization came together to promote international peace. This culminated on 25th April 1945 at a conference in San Francisco, uh, the United States, in which the outlines of what would eventually be the United Nations Charter uh, were hammered out. And in October of 1945, 51 states ratified the United Nations Charter and hence the United Nations was born. And it was born as a global diplomatic and political organization dedicated to international peace and stability and to avoid abuses of war. At the outset, the UN had only 51 signatories to the Charter. Today, the United Nations has 193 members. And the major initiatives of the United Nations include preventing conflict by exploring options to ensure peace, providing food and medical assistance in emergencies, and offering humanitarian support to millions of people around the world. Even though the UN is sometimes criticized for its policies, bureaucracy, and spending, the organization has accomplished hundreds of successful peacekeeping missions. In its website, the UN describes its functions uh, as four main functions or four main goals. One is to maintain international peace and security. Two is to develop friendly relations amongst nations. Three is to achieve international cooperation in solving international problems. And four, to be a center for harmonizing uh, the actions of nations 
in the attainment of these common ends. In a sense, the purpose of the United Nations is to save existing generations from the scourge of war. This is a very lofty challenge, to save existing generations from the scourge of war. Meeting this challenge can be a daunting task. However, this is the only barometer, this is the only yardstick by which we can judge the successes of the United Nations. Uh, we cannot talk about post-conflict recovery without first of all achieving peace. I therefore postulate that the success of economic recovery, or recovery for that matter, general recovery, for any state, will to a large or considerable extent depend on how peaceful the environment is. Fragile peace does not bode well for easy and quick recovery. And the UN has very limited tools to ensure restoration of peace in conflict zones. You may all know this, but UN peacekeeping intervention takes mainly two forms. One is a chapter six intervention, and the other is a chapter seven intervention, as they would call it. Uh, chapter six deals with the Pacific settlement of disputes, uh, and it involves the sending of observer missions deployment of envoys, the use of good offices, and so forth. That is the diplomacy bit about it. And chapter seven deals with the enforcement powers of the United Nations Security Council, and uh, which is basically tasked with the responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. And the, those powers in, include the power to impose sanctions, uh, the power to take such actions by air, land, sea forces as may be necessary to maintain or restore international peace and security. That is actually the awesome power of the United Nations. They can mobilize forces and attack a country or a place in the name of maintenance of international peace and security under the mandate of the United Nations Security Council. That is real awesome power. But this power of the United Nations was rather constricted or stifled, if I may, during the Cold War. I am sure most of you would know the Cold War. That was the basically silent war between USSR and, uh, and the United States. Uh, and that Cold War significantly hampered the ability of the UN to achieve its greatest potential in the maintenance of international peace and security. It basically paralyzed the, 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 the UN. It paralyzed the Security Council. It paralyzed the UN. So, how did the UN Security Council respond? They just did the simple things that they could do. And, and why was it the case that the Cold War actually paralyzed the United Nations or the Security Council for that matter? You had two countries, Russia, well, sorry, United, USSR, uh, Soviet Union, and then you have the United States. They could hardly agree on anything. And the Security Council, the architecture of the Security Council is that five member states have veto powers. If they vote against a decision, that decision collapses. But you have the US here and the USSR, on the other hand, they could hardly agree on anything. So you see, UN intervention was difficult to, to, to obtain. So what the Security Council could do was to limit itself 
to the simple, simple things that they could do to help achieve international peace and security. Like negotiating ceasefire agreements between belligerent parties, stabilizing violence, and uh, using diplomatic means to arrive at solutions. But of course, that was not really a solution to the problem. So then you had protracted conflicts going on around the world, and there were no solutions. So the UN became a talking shop, and the Security Council was a toothless bulldog because it could not bite. But this was hardly a situation that really benefited mankind. But the Cold War ended in the early 90s. The situation started to change. I arrived at the United Nations on 1st January 1998. And what I found there was hardly satisfactory. Uh, as a young diplomat and uh, as the legal advisor to the Gambia Permanent Mission, which was elected to the Security Council, we were faced with this situation that we are representing West Africa in the UN Security Council, and we had to push the position and views and aspirations of the West African delegations that are in the United Nations. But more important, we had to serve the ideals of the United Nations. And here we are, still trapped in the mindset of the Cold War, still trapped in the polarization of various blocks uh, and rivalries between various countries, the Security Council could not do as much as it should have been able to do. And I give you a few examples. Uh, the United Nations deployed forces to Yugoslavia because there was the war in Yugoslavia. Bosnia uh, and Serbia and all those wars that were going on. But in order to deploy a United Nations mission, they had to negotiate a mandate for the mission, that this is what you are tasked to do. And this is the authority under which you are to do it. So if you're given a chapter six mandate, it means you cannot use force. You have your guns and everything, but you cannot even shoot. How is that helpful to anybody? Sometimes you are given a mandate, but the language of the mandate is so watered down that at the end of the day, it becomes meaningless. It's not fit for purpose. Or there is so much ambiguity deliberately built into it just to satisfy the wishes of the various delegations to the extent that at the end of the day, when it comes to implementation, there isn't much you can do. And I'll give you a few examples of in which I was involved in. But let's first talk about Srabenaika. Srabenaika was attacked. This was a UN safe zone being guarded by the Dutch, a Dutch contingent, a, a military outfit, military uh, contingent from the Netherlands. They were given the task to protect the people who were there. But they did not have the mandate to fight. And what happened? The zone was overrun and 350 people were massacred. In the face of the United Nations, there they were standing and watching. People being massacred. 
But this was not the only place this such a thing has happened. If you look at Rwanda, in 100 days, over 800,000 people were killed, and the United Nations were there. They could not do anything. Why could they not do anything? Because they did not have the mandate to fight. It was after these events that the United Nations said it would no longer allow evil such as those that have happened in these places to be perpetrated and the United Nations would sit back and not do anything. And that was the genesis or the beginning of the concept of humanitarian intervention. But this is very important. Just imagine the United Nations is standing by with their guns and tanks and everything. And they allowed a ragtag of forces to just come over on the place and take and kill people. And I will tell you one from my own experience. Two weeks after I arrived at the UN Security Council, I attended a meeting on Sierra Leone. And Sierra Leone definitely is the constituency that I represented because we were representing West Africa. It's the region that we represented. And fortunately, I went to university in Sierra Leone and I understood the place. The war started in my presence. I at least had some little idea about the war. Because in campus, we would sit there and rebels would wander into campus. So we would see them, we would interact with them. I knew at the time that a lot of the rebels were always high on drugs. And a lot of them, there were children in children bearing arms. So I knew this fact. So when I attended the first meeting drafting this resolution, they came up with what is called a chapter six and a half resolution. It is a little more than chapter six, but it is not an enforcement power as you would have in chapter seven. So they call it the Chinese formula. How did it become the Chinese formula? It is as a result of compromise because they never could agree on anything. The ideal would be chapter 7. Russia and China would never accept chapter 7. But the rest of the world would not accept chapter 6 because it's weak. So what do you have? They, start, they struck a compromise to come up with something called chapter 6 and a half. So it's just your basic right of self-defense, which is also the a right in chapter 6. So it's meaningless. So in that negotiation, they said, well, we can only go with a chapter six and a half resolution for Sierra Leone. I kept laughing. And I recall a British delegate asked me, what is funny? I said, I know this would fail. And then I was swiftly and quickly brushed aside. This is the new guy at the security council. Who is he telling us that this is going to fail? So, of course, Gambia being a small country in the world, what powers does it have in the security council? So our objections were quickly mooted, and the resolution passed. And then, quickly, the Secretary General deployed Indian troops to, to, to Sierra Leone. And a few days after they arrived, they were all rounded up and captured by 15-year-olds carrying AK-47s. Such an embarrassment to the United Nations. Just imagine, 15-year-olds rounded up the Indian contingent. And the UN had to resort to going to negotiate to free those people. 
it was a travesty. It could have led to disaster because a lot of those kids were high on drugs. And you know, in some of these rebel groups, command and control can be very loose. They are not trained soldiers. They are not under a very disciplined and regimented force. So therefore, they can act ruthlessly and outside the rules of armed conflict. So this is just one crazy example of what happened. So quickly, we had to change. But we only changed after a terrible embarrassment. Another example is the UN biases, because these things are always a product of negotiation. See, we from the Gambia, we were very concerned about what was happening in Guinea-Bissau. Because there was a terrible war going on behind at our backyard in Guinea-Bissau. We wanted something done about Guinea-Bissau. There was no political will. There was no appetite at the United Nations Security Council to do anything about it. And therefore, the war in Guinea-Bissau continued. Drugs, it became a haven for drugs, and that also affected our countries. But because the UN, it's difficult to hammer out agreements on anything, <clears throat> nothing could be done about Guinea-Bissau. <clears throat> Let's talk about Kosovo, for instance. <clears throat> in 1999, I think at this time, Gambia was also president of the Security Council. So it meant that every problem concerning international armed conflict or interstate conflict, it will come to us. So very heavy responsibility being president of the Security Council because you coordinate the activities of the Security Council. We have worked on a resolution for Yugoslavia, for the protection of Kosovo. No agreement could be reached. And the US became so frustrated. You, could, you sit at the Security Council table round table discussing these things. And you could see, you could feel the tension in the room. You could see, you could feel the tension that things are not well. Sometimes even diplomats can hit the table just to show frustration. Everything was done, nothing. And suddenly the U.S. said, if nothing was done, they were going to do the unthinkable. They were going to attack. And then they started bandying around the phrase humanitarian intervention, humanitarian intervention, we are going to do it. And one day, we just woke up, I think it was 24th of March, and we saw the bombs were dropping in Kosovo. And then the telephone started ringing, security council meeting. Look, it was frantic. Instantly there was an emergency, informal meeting of the council and a formal meeting of the security council. I think it was a Sunday. Something like that. This just shows some of the problems that the United Nations has to deal with in its interventions. And in Kosovo, the US organized NATO, that is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and then they attacked. That brought about the end to some of the problems that were happening there. I'll give you another very difficult example. You remember Iraq. Iraq was attacked in 1991 uh, because Iraq was believed to have been in violations of certain UN 
uh, conventions by proliferating uh, nuclear materials and also uh, stockpiling uh, biological and chemical weapons. So in 1991, the first Gulf War, because Iraq attacked Kuwait to annex it, so uh, the US and NATO, they, well, I think it was on the Security Council, but they attacked to liberate Kuwait. But then they came up with sanctions against Iraq and started a disarmament of Iraq. But in so doing, they had to control all the resources of Iraq. So for Iraq to eat anything, it had to get the approval of the UN Security Council to buy that thing. That was the oil for food program. So the entire resources of Iraq we are now being controlled by the United Nations. It's like telling this country, you know what? We don't trust you. We don't trust that if you have money in your pocket, you're not going to buy a gun and bullets and start killing everybody. So we'll control your money. And we'll also check everywhere to see that you don't have weapons. Is that a good place to be in? Well, that is what happened to Iraq. I could recall... Uh, having meetings with uh, Tariq Aziz, who was the then Deputy Prime Minister of Iraq. And when he described how it felt to them, you could feel the pain that the Iraqis were going through. How they were being raped or stripped of their sovereignty. Terrible situation. You know, for Iraqis to even buy makeup, for their women, they had to apply to the 911 committee. And then we had to sit there and decide whether Iraqi women should wear makeup or should not wear makeup. So we decide to approve or not to approve. That is how bad it was. I mean, I participated in the technical committee. So all the applications would come. So we would vet the applications. No, this is not necessary for Iraq. This is necessary. Can you imagine? But that is also shows the awesome power of the United Nations. But it also shows the dysfunctionality of the organization at that time simply because of disagreements between various countries, especially the permanent members of the UN Security Council. But this is just the tip of the iceberg, because as at this time, they could talk to one another. As at this time, the Cold War had ended. I, I, I even had joined, occasionally joined uh, uh, Ambassador Lavrov, say, saying uh, Lavrov is now foreign minister uh, of, uh, of, of, of Russia, uh, and the, 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 the then UN ambassador. Over cigarettes and cigars, you sit around the corners and have a puff. So now the US ambassador, or the US permanent representative, and the Russian permanent representative can enjoy coffee and cigar and talk and laugh. You know? Unlike the previous times when they looked almost at Daga's end all the time. So, so as at the time I was there, things were a bit better. But just imagine the situation I have described. It was dismal. It was disappointing. But that was the nature of things. So by the late 90s, the Cold War had ended. The UN Security Council enjoyed greater flexibility and cooperation among its members, which really created a boon for the UN in the sense that the, U the United Nations could now engage in a range of activities and mandates for keeping peacekeeping operations, which previously would be unthinkable. Peacekeepers are now called upon not just to help bring about peace and to maintain it, but also to help build government institutions, promote human rights, and set up police forces, 
do justice sector reform and carry out disarmament and demobilization programs. But the political rivalries, the political reality and the differences in approach and values constantly hampered UN peacekeeping interventions. As a result, even though things have changed significantly, the UN remains to be less effective than it could. And therefore, it was open to the criticisms that it fails in the situations where it is entrusted with responsibility to maintain international peace and security, or that it is too weak to deal with violence, or that it often interferes with national sovereignty. So the success rate of the UN at this time was not good at all. Wasn't good at all. But the 1990s still created some new hope for people that the UN would be able to deliver on its mandate. But this 1990s also brought in a terrible situation. That's when you had a lot of intrastate conflict, that is civil wars. You had a lot of violent civil wars. You had Sierra Leone, you had Liberia, just uh, in our area, and then you also have Guinea-Bissau, and to a lesser extent, Senegal, that is Casamas. But you cannot even discuss Casamas at the Security Council because France would not let anybody discuss it. Because France also has a veto power. So, so, so you see the problem. But these civil wars were often long and brutal, and they continue to harm societies long after ceasefires have been reached. And countries emerging out of these conflicts they face significant challenges with respect to maintaining peace and ensuring development. The United Nations still continue to be in the forefront to help states recover economically from these devastating conflicts and help build durable and lasting peace. And in some areas, they have succeeded significantly. And I'll give you a few examples. East Timor, I participated in writing the resolution that sent the United Nations to East Timor. There was a war Well, East Timor was given the opportunity by Indonesia to do a referendum to decide whether it wanted to remain as part of Indonesia or would become an independent state. And the East Timorese overwhelmingly voted for independence uh, in the referendum that was organized and supervised by the United Nations. The, East, the Indonesian backed militia ransacked East Timor, attacked and killed a lot of people, and basically destroyed the whole country by way of bombing. They basically burnt the whole country down. So the United Nations uh, organized a UN mission to go and rescue East Timor from the ashes uh, of, 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 that, of that war. And uh, I had the good fortune to be amongst those who were uh, deployed to go and help. But even before I left, I participated in ensuring that Gambian police and military officers, and even civilians, were also deployed to East Timor to help. So when the UN arrived, there was no government. So the UN was tasked, it was untied, the United Nations Transitional Administration for East Timor. It was tasked to now create and build a government from scratch. It meant we have to build all the institutions. You have to create a police force. You have to create a judiciary. You have to create a justice sector. 
you have to create prisons, you have to create Ministry of Health, Agriculture, and all the necessary institutions you would find in a democratic country. The fact that the UN was able to deploy a transitional administration to East Timor by itself was a huge achievement because really for the council at the time to agree such a huge enterprise was really surprising, pleasantly. But there you have it. We went to East Timor, we wrote laws, we created institutions, we trained people, and after two years, the UN was able to transfer the whole government to the East Timorese. The UN now took a back seat to become advisors and, uh, and support staff to the East Timorese as they charged their way to the government. That is one brilliant, successful story of recovery that the UN has organized and executed. Uh, there are also some other examples. Liberia, to a lesser extent, the UN assisted in many fronts, and Liberia was able to emerge out of conflict and has recovered. But Sierra Leone, for instance, Sierra Leone went through a 10-year war in which thousands and thousands of people were killed, thousands or hundreds amputated. The, with the assistance of ECOMOC, with the assistance of the AU and the United Nations, they were able to restore peace in that country and help the country to recover. Even therefore, to a lesser extent, uh, when I went to the ICC, I was recruited mainly to guide the Darfur investigations, to lead the Darfur investigations, and later to lead the Darfur prosecutions. And in Darfur, the Sudanese government killed 350,000 black Africans. 350,000 black Africans. At the time, the United Nations described this as the world's worst humanitarian crisis. And with various interventions, African Union and the United Nations, they were able to stabilize the situation and peace has been restored. And up to today, you have Gambian peacekeepers in Darfur. So these are good examples of United Nations interventions that have helped the government. Even in Kenya, you remember in 2007, there was post-election violence in Kenya. Okay, it was quelled by Kenyans, but at least the United Nations came in to assist in the recovery process. And that included the justice intervention angle of these recovery processes. Because the recovery process is not just economic, it entails transitional justice, it entails reconciliation and all that, and the United Nations is more suited to help in those things. So for Kenya, those who were believed to have been responsible for the violence were prosecuted. I had the good fortune, or the misfortune, as you may say, to, to, to defend them, so we defended them successfully, which meant that the wrong people were prosecuted in, in my view. But, but this is the system working very well. And all this happened as a result of United Nations assistance. Is anybody here who can remember the envelope that was given to the ICC prosecutor by Kofi Annan and Lamin Sisi? Uh, our own Lamin Sisi? That was the envelope that contained the names of the Kenyans that should be prosecuted. Uh, you know. So fortunately for us, we were able to defend them successfully. But UN intervention in the maintenance of peace and security and ensuring recovery has witnessed significant failures. The record is not very good at all. I mean, I have mentioned some significant successes 
but uh, the record is not very good. But it is important to show that the United Nations has a very important vision of, of extending a strong helping hand to a community, country or region to avert conflict or to end violence. They always aspire to ensure that when they leave a mission, the people of the country have the opportunity to do for themselves what they could not do before. To build and hold on to peace, to find reconciliation, to strengthen democracy, and to secure human rights. And these are really the tangibles of any recovery. In a sense, the ideal is to have a United Nations that has not only the will, but also the ability to, feel, to fulfill the great promise of the United Nations and to justify the confidence and trust placed in it by the overwhelming majority of humankind. Over the years, the UN has struggled to meet these lofty objectives, but it has made significant efforts to reform and reshape itself to deliver on the expectations of humankind. One of those efforts that I personally experienced is the work of the Brahimi panel. Uh, Ambassador Lahda Brahimi uh, was former foreign minister of, Libya, of, of, of Algeria. In early 2000, uh, Secretary General Kofi Annan set up a panel uh, headed by uh, Lahda Brahim and comprised of people with extensive experience in diplomacy uh, to help to help reshape the United Nations uh, and uh, so that they would examine the existing system, assess its shortcomings and make frank specific and realistic recommendations for change. Their recommendations focused not only on political change, but also on the strategy, operations, and organizational structure of the United Nations. That panel made profound and, or recommended profound and groundbreaking changes for the United Nations. Uh, the panel noted, however, that without renewed commitment on the part of member states and significant institutional change and increased financial support, the United Nations will never be capable of executing the critical peacekeeping and peace building tasks that member states have assigned to them. But in order for the panel in order for them to be able to deliver, far-reaching changes were to be made. While in East Timor, we saw that the United Nations really made a significant effort at changing the organization. Fully integrated missions were now being deployed. And that help produce better results. Up to this day, the UN is reforming itself. It has created uh, a peace building support office, the PBSO, and that is helping a lot of countries in their recovery process. Uh, the Gambia is a classic example. Post Jame, the Gambia embarked on a transitional justice program in order to transition from dictatorship to a full democracy, in order to trans transform from a rule by one man to a rule by law. We could not do that without the assistance of the UN Peace Building Support Office and the UNDP. So the TRRC that we have today came about as a result of that support. So you see the UN is changing. It's constantly becoming innovative in finding solutions that would help countries in their recovery process. 
So they are retooling and they are repeating. In fact, the current Secretary General has advocated a very holistic approach to UN interventions. In so doing, he has strengthened ties with regional organizations and international financial institutions. And this is a very important one. I remember in 1999, the Gambian delegation at the United Nations Security Council had to embark on a project to help the United Nations and regional organizations forge a stronger partnership. And the Gambia had to sponsor a resolution, uh, really, that uh, help foster greater cooperation and coordination between the United Nations and regional organizations. And that is what led to the creation of the AU-UN uh, liaison office now in Addis. And that was as a result of, 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 of laudable Gambian efforts. And such efforts still continue. The current Secretary General has established stronger ties uh, between mainstream United Nations, that is the UN Secretariat, and even the financial institutions, so that they can all join forces to help assist in countries' recovery. And when I talk about UN intervention in post-conflict recovery, we're not only talking about the United Nations Security Council or the United Nations Secretariat. We are talking about the entire United Nations system, which comprises of the United Nations Secretariat and the United Nations agencies, that is UNDP, UNICEF, WHO, and others, and also the Bretton Woods institutions. But now, one would add the ICC. The ICC, the International Criminal Court, is not part of the United Nations, right? But it is a sister organization, all aimed at serving uh, mankind as ensuring a better life and condition for mankind. So these organizations should all work in tandem to ensure that the greater good is provided for mankind. So while the UN is not perfect, it is constantly looking for solutions to its architecture to be more able to effectively respond to the problems of the world. The UN needs the support of all of us, but also the support and political will of governments to ensure that the United Nations is assisted to be able to deliver on the wishes and aspirations of mankind. On that note, I thank you very much. If there are questions, as I expect there would be, perhaps I should just answer them uh, sitting down, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. Um, all right. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Esafra. I want to believe that this has been a very, very inspiring lecture. And I want to believe that we have learned a lot. Uh, we still want to learn more from such engagements uh, with experts like Mr. Esafal, uh, people that have traveled extensively, they have worked extensively within the UN system, and the, the amount of engagements also they have been um, into are also very extensive, to the extent that I know if we had given him more time, <laughs> he would have been able to do more than four hours of, of lecture. But we are very appreciative of, of the time you have dedicated for, for us. Normally, I think um, tradition would de demand that somebody would have to do, you know, to summarize most of the things that he has talked about. I, I think I'm going to skip the protocols this time around. I'll not necessarily talk about them because perhaps maybe I'll confuse things. <laughs> All right, but just to highlight, um, some of the most important things that, that he has discussed about. Um, these are some of the things that we had also discussed within our UN system class. Um, that is the role of the United Nations in peace building, peace support operations, and peace enforcement um, operations. The UN coming in when things are very tough, and at first trying to arrest the situation and put things in order, 
and then later on it would move on to work on building institutes and building the judiciary system, transforming the police force, for example, and many other um, activities that the UN is, is, is involved in. It's, it is very important that you had highlighted on the chapter six and the chapter six and a half um, resolutions. These are very difficult things usually for the UN to, to craft a mandate around a peacekeeping mission. Um, you would understand the use of veto rights. Most importantly, it makes it a very complicated issue. If the US is not happy with a certain thing around that particular resolution, getting a, a mandate for the mission becomes um, a very difficult thing. I think personally, regarding our, our situation in 2016, I was very worried when ECOWAS would have to get a UN resolution or would have to get the UN backing before they can put forces into the Gambia. My fear at the time was, what if some member of the, the Permanent Five, the P5, was not happy with the situation and would veto that particular uh, force that was supposed to come here, that is the economic force? What then was going to be our situation? Personally, this was my worry when the forces were in Dakar already, but they had to wait for the UN blessing. Essentially, we know, uh, I think, um, Almost all UN peacekeeping missions would not happen without the blessing of the United Nations Security Council. So I was very worried at the time what was going to happen to Gambia if a resolution is not being established or that mission is not given the blessing of the United Nations Security Council. I think the lesson is, is quite clear and the message is also clear in the sense that peace is something that we can never compromise for whatever reason. Um, imagine some of the situations he's been talking about that if Iraqis would even need makeup, you'd have to get the UN Security Council approvals for those things. You know, that shows how difficult it is to live in a conflict environment or in a conflicting environment. Um, before I call some student to make uh, the vote of thanks, I think I will invite questions, And but before that, I don't know if you would leave us with some assurance that you will be able to get us Dr. Caesar here. All right, he has promised to get us Dr. Cizé of the, of the TRRC. I, I think it's going to be also a very interesting public lecture um, that, that would be on the pipeline. So I'll, I'll call on Abdullah Alami to, he will do the vote of thanks, but before that maybe we can settle for how many questions do you think you can take? As much as possible. All right, fine. So if you have questions, you can quickly come to the podium and you can make your questions to Mr. Farah. Yes, go. Okay. Good morning to you. Good afternoon, sorry. I am Fatma Dakeda, student of Management Develop Development Institute, MDI. I'm studying um, National Deployment Management Studies. I have three questions for the lead council. First of all, uh, I want to know the differences between the mandate six, six and a half, and the seven, because you made mention that Mandate six, uh, the UN, the mandate six didn't have the right to uh, fight, so it means they were not responding to stimulus. The second question is you said Iraq's economy and resources were uh, controlled by the UN. How were the UN able to control their resources? And the war in Syria really as, as well, you said it. The Iraq war. Yes. Iraq economy, how was it, uh, the resources, how was the UN able to control it? And then you said the Syrian Union will last for 10 years. Yeah, it was a bit confusing to all oh, 10 years. Uh, thank you very much. I am happy that it's a lady that started asking questions. Uh, you know, uh, things are changing quite pleasantly in Gambia. The ladies are in the forefront of things. <laughs> Fantastic. Keep it up. Um, yes, what the difference is the charter provides for two powers. Uh, one is the Pacific Settlement of Disputes, that is under Chapter 6, that enables the UN to negotiate ceasefires, deploy envoys, deploy good offices, and so forth. All right? and, and self-defense and so forth. And then you have chapter seven. Chapter seven it involves the use of force. It allows the United Nations, 
excuse me, it allows the United Nations to deploy military or armed personnel to countries and enforce certain decisions of the Security Council. And that is why you have a lot of Gambian forces. They, they, they were in Liberia, but that was under ECOMO. And here we have ECOMIC, under, still under ECOWAS. But the United Nations have equally deployed forces in several places. So, so those deployments are usually under Chapter 7. If they are under Chapter 7, it enables the UN to use force to implement decisions. You understand? You see, the UN is supposed to be neutral, supposed to be impartial. But sometimes, okay, if A is attacking B and they are having a legitimate fight, you just stand, up, stand aside because you don't want to take sides. But if these people are civilians, they need protection. So should they just stand by? Exactly. So uh, Chapter 7 would enable the UN to do certain things, to force things. Chapter 7 would enable the UN to attack places and, and capture soldiers. It allows the UN to go into war pretty much. Uh, so, so that is essentially the differences. It's the amount of power that is given the, to, 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 to the UN when they are deployed. You see, so this chapter six and a half does not necessarily exist in the charter. You have chapter six, you have chapter seven. But then, when the UN writes the resolutions, they state the chapter under which the, the powers are given. So if they say, uh, acting on the chapter six of the charter, we give you the power to defend yourself, to do this, to do that, it, it is something, even though they cited only chapter six, but the authority goes above chapter six. So we call it the Chinese formula, chapter six and a half. You know, it's just a pretension that we are giving you chapter seven, but we do not say that we are acting on the chapter seven. So that is, that is the difference. But this is all about the diplomacy in the United Nations, because it is difficult to hammer out agreements in some of these difficult issues. You understand? That's the first question, right? Uh, the second question was about the Iraqi economy. How did the UN come to control the Iraqi economy? Remember, there was a war. There was a Gulf War, all right? And uh, the Iraqi forces were removed from Kuwait. And the Iraqi government fell. Saddam Hussein, Tariq Aziz, and all these others were apprehended and tried. Saddam Hussein was executed. But then there was a transitional administration in Iraq. You remember. The Iraqis did not necessarily run their own government. And there were sanctions. So, some of the sanctions created what was called the oil for food program. Because Iraq was not allowed to export oil on its own. So Iraqi oil was being exported in exchange for food. So the money was kept in an escrow account to be controlled by the United Nations uh, Oil for Food Committee or whatever. I forgot some of the details. Understand. So whatever Iraq wanted to buy, they would make an application to the United Nations. And that application, those applications would come to the 911 committee and the Security Council. And it, we would decide whether they would buy that or would not buy that. When we give approval, the UN, UN Secretariat would buy and send to Iraq. If we do not, that is the UN Procurement Office or the UN Office of Procurement Services, something like that. So this was the arrangement. Um, it was not the best situation. But you see, getting an agreement at the Security Council, which is responsible for the maintenance of international peace and security, is always very difficult. Now, these are the two questions. What was the third one? Oh, the Sierra Union war. Yes, that lasted 10 years. You know, from 1991 to, to 2001, there are about. I'm not sure of the exact dates, but but that's how long it lasted. I, I remember 
when they first attacked, uh, they first attacked, I think, in 1990. Uh, Charles Taylor, I think, went to Banga in 1989. You understand? Yes, that's when he first attacked. So he took over, let me not bother the date, but the war in Sierra Leone started after Charles Taylor had already taken over in, in, in Liberia. Uh, so some of the NPFL forces in, in Liberia, well, they incorporated some Sierra Leoneans and for the Sanko and others, and they attacked Liberia. So that war lasted 10 years. Thank you very much. I hope I have answered your question. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Fondi Ejalo, a former parliamentarian. Uh, let me simply thank our able uh, presenters, uh, Mr. Esafal. Uh, actually, I was listening clearly, but uh, unfortunately, half of my mind shifted to your father, remembering those days when he used to stand in front of us at the classroom, teaching us agri-sign, and then today is the son who are giving us a powerful lecture. So this is what we call history repetition. So thank you very much. Um, then we talk about uh, uh, peacekeeping operation. But looking at the nature of peacekeeping operation nowadays, to me, we are more of peace combatant than a peacekeeping operation. So what do you think peacekeeping nowadays? Are there a solution for international conflict? OK, so that's my first question. And then within the UN system, hardly I hear or heard about, about um, conflict or um, uh, prevention, um, conflict prevention, but uh, I mean, conflict prevention, but always maybe intervention. But why did it have any system that to deal with conflict prevention before it happened, before it occurred within their system? Okay, but how do you get the question? And then you, Mr. Fall, as an African son, do you think we will ever do away from armed conflict and intervention or whatsoever? And what is the way forward for us as Africa? Thank you so much. I, I will take the last questions first. Uh, you said whether we would ever be free from armed conflict. People do not fight just because they want to fight. People fight because they believe they have a reason to fight. People believe, people fight because they believe they've been marginalized. Uh, let me take it again. People don't fight simply because they want to fight. People fight for reasons. People fight because they believe they are marginalized. People fight because they believe their rights are being taken away. People fight because they believe they are made not to matter. People fight because they believe they have been disadvantaged. People fight because they believe that they are not treated justly, humanely, or properly. So the only way we can have a world or a country free from strife is if we have a country that is based on rule of law and not based on the rule of man. If we have a country where things are certain to go according to law, where there are democratic norms, where we have democratic institutions, where there is democratic accountability for what happens, where there is justice, then there would be no reason for war. There would be no reason for anyone to fight. And it is our collective responsibility, all of us, to ensure that we have such kind of environments. And to have that you have to hold your governments accountable. If we cease to hold our governments accountable, they develop into monsters that we cannot control 
and therefore there would be a lot of dissatisfaction in the society, it would lead to chaos and it would lead to war. Respect for rights is critical. Fair and equal treatment of the people is important. Doing things according to law is important. Unless we do that, we would continue to pay the price. I hope that answers your question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the other question, you raised questions about prevention and intervention. Well, it's just the old age uh, saying, I can say it in Wolof, my fagaru, mogen fagaru. Hmm? Prevention is better than care. Uh, the UN embarks on a lot of conflict prevention activities. A right? lot of prevention interventions, like the deployment of good offices, envoys, and all that, peace conferences, and negotiations, and mediation, and all these pertain to prevention. Even the use of the ICC power is, prevent is prevention, or so it has a deterrent effect. Okay. But when these things fail, more robust intervention measures may have to be taken. And some of these in include, may include Chapter 7 interventions, uh, like uh, military forces and things like that. Uh, you raised the issue of economic in Gambia. That's, that was an important observation. Uh, you remember that the first regional, uh, the first ECOMOC deployment was organized from Gambia. Uh, that was when Jawara was in power, that was organized for Liberia. Uh, so this economic we have is just a similar regional intervention. But of course, these things do not happen uh, without the approval of the United Nations Security Council. There would have been negotiations and meetings, uh, you know, in the corridors and the margins, where the UN Security Council is briefed and informed about all these things, and then uh, they may give an endorsement or support and things like that. You know, that's what the Office of the Secretary General does. They believe they, re, they brief the Security Council on all matters of international peace and security almost on a daily basis. So, so, so that deals with that. Have I answered all your questions? All right. Thank, thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. I, I think we are going to have a slight changes in the protocol in that there are many people that want to ask questions. So what we do is everyone, we can, uh, I'll restrict you to one question. So everyone would have their their turn. I, I think that's that's quite okay. No, just restricted to one place. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Tijan Fual. Uh, my question, I have anyway more than one question, but Mr. Double said I should stick to one. I have no choice. Uh, I just want you to elaborate on the difference uh, of an executive mission. What do we mean by an executive mission? And under which chapter does the executive mission fall? Is it six or seven? Also, uh, it's a pertinent question anyway. Also, if you can uh, elaborate on the difference between the peacekeeping, peacemaking, and peace building, what are the differences? Thank you. Uh, hello, thank you very much. I, I am sure that I understand the concept of executive mission. Uh, it's a term with which I'm not familiar but nobody has knowledge over everything. So if you have, I'd be happy to learn from you. Uh, but if I were to hazard a guess, uh, it would perhaps mean diplomatic missions where special envoys and things like that are sent to good offices and so forth. Uh, the other type of missions <clears throat> I talked about were enforcement missions. And enforcement missions are missions under Chapter 7 that would allow the UN to come and forcibly do certain things. Uh, like say, for instance, they come to uh, implement a ceasefire, both by all parties must succumb or they have to fight. Uh, so those are enforcement missions. 
So, but I am really not familiar with this concept of executive mission. Uh, maybe I may have mispronounced something. Uh, I, I really don't know how that, that, that term came about, but I'm not familiar with that concept. So the differences between peacekeeping, peacemaking, and peace building, I think the differences lie in the words that have been used. Peacekeeping happens when there is a peace to keep. When already you have an agreement between two belligerent parties, and then they have agreed to a ceasefire, that is when you go for a peacekeeping mission. You have to keep the peace between the two sides. The peacemaking is the process of getting to the peacekeeping. When you bring in the two parties and try to hammer out an agreement between them, that is the process of making peace. And the peace building is when already you have achieved a ceasefire, there's a, you, you are keeping the peace, then you take steps to strengthen the peace that has been achieved. And that is the peace building. The recovery process that we were talking about all falls part of the peace building. So peace building uh, mechanisms would involve like confidence building measures. You know when two people fight, there is a lot of mistrust between them. As part of the peace building measures, you try to build trust between them. So you build confidence between the two parties. You build transparency. Transparency mechanisms help peace building. You strengthen institutions and things like that. And you bring about justice, you bring about reconciliation. That is all part of peace building. Is it clear now? Uh, thank you very much. No, no, no. Okay. Well, you can direct dilate on uh, executive uh, uh, missions. Oh. I am not familiar with. That. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Uh, Oli. Well, just a reminder. One question. Yes, yes, yes. One question. So everybody will have their turn. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Olita. I'm a student of MDI. Um, I have two questions, but since my lecture is here, I'm allowed to ask only one, and I'll go for the second one. Um, I am made to understand that 54 countries are comprised uh, in the UN, African countries, comprises the UN, which is nearly 28%. So my question is, are we really being represented in the UN? And I would like to, I would just want to have a short quick um, answer about the um, Indian military that was deployed and then the rebels surrounded them. The UN, which chapter do they use? Was it the six or the six and a half or they go for the seven? Thank you. I, I'll take the, the last one first since you have somehow asked two questions. Uh, the, uh, the Indians, uh, the, the, the mandate was chapter six, okay? We call it chapter six and a half because it went beyond what is provided in chapter six, but it did not go to the extent of what was provided for under chapter seven. And uh, the thing is, when you write the resolution, you have to state the chapter under which you are acting. Since there is no provision for chapter six and a half, it has to be under chapter six. You understand? We only call it chapter six and a half because we know that it's gone a little above what chapter six would ordinary, ordinarily allow for. So we call it chapter six and a half. It's a Chinese formula. So it's just, uh, you know, to a point for compromise. You understand? Um, so the other question, I have forgotten exactly what it was. I did not write it. Could you say again? Okay, the number of African countries in the UN and whether Africa is ably represented. Uh, I will say no. Uh, because if you look at it, how many representatives does Africa have in the Security Council? Because remember that uh, the United Nations, okay, everybody is equal in the General Assembly. You understand? So that is for everybody. But when it comes to the Security Council, you have 15 member states in the Security Council. 
All right? Uh, and you have five of them that have veto power. England, United States, uh, France, uh, Russia, and China. Everybody else is excluded. All right? Then the, ten, the remaining 10 members is divided into regions. Okay? Africa, I think, has four, I think. Uh, I, I can't remember the figures quite well because I haven't looked at this for over uh, 20 years now. Uh, you know, so but we we are about fifty three or fifty four countries in the United Nations. So so really we have less representation uh, because just look at Europe. They have England veto power, they have France veto power, and they would have other European countries represented. So so one of the biggest challenges of the United Nations is reforming the Security Council because the the the, the power, the decision-making authority for the most important thing in the United Nations, that is the maintenance of international peace and security, is vested with the, with the Security Council. So it's been struggling with reforms. I haven't quite followed up uh, re re recent reforms, but Africa has always been claiming that they would want to have a permanent seat uh, at the, uh, the, or a veto power uh, at the Security Council, and uh, really, uh, lots of negotiations have happened over the years for the reform of the membership of the UN Security Council and the veto power, but uh, nothing concrete, as far as I know, has happened yet. Maybe, uh, maybe changes, there may be changes in the membership. I haven't quite checked that yet, I have to be honest about that, but I think that there has not been any significant change in the structure and organization of the Security Council. So I would say that Africa is certainly not adequately represented at the UN Security Council. All right, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Kumba Jawate. Again, I'm reminding one question. Oh, good afternoon. Thank you. My name is Kumba Jawate, a student of MDI and also studying diplomacy and international relations. Um, Honorable, my question will be what lead to the failure of the League of Nations, considering the fact that they have similar purposes to that of the United Nations in maintaining international peace and security. Uh, the League of Nations failed for many reasons. Uh, at the height of, this, it's of the negotiations for the League of Nations, uh, war had already broken out, and uh, there was the Second World War, so which also stifled efforts. But you should also imagine that negotiating an international organization with such lofty mandates would always be very difficult. So, and uh, obviously the League of Nations failed. But when, once World War II kicked in, it reinforced the importance of having an international organization that would be responsible for international peace and security. And that is why uh, they were able to hammer out that agreement and uh, the Charter of the United Nations and have 51 signatories in October in San Francisco. But soon thereafter, the membership uh, grew until what it is today at 193. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so my question is, hence, hence the UN operate on the two chapters, chapter 6 and 7. And I know the economic mission in the Gambia are not operating on the chapter 7. Which of the chapters are they operating in the Gambia? The economic, the economic mission. Uh, uh, the UN 
operates under the Charter of the United Nations. And I repeat that. The UN operates under the Charter of the United Nations and all relevant provisions of the Charter are applied. Okay? Uh, you talk about Chapter 6 and 7 when you talk about the UN Security Council. You remember uh, the UN has several organs. You have the Security Council, you have the General Assembly, you have ECOSOC, that is the Economic and Social Council. You understand? So you have to look at the structure of the United Nations. They all operate under the Charter of the United Nations. So when we talk about Chapter 6 and 7, that deals only with the Security Council. That is the power of the Security Council with regards to the maintenance of international peace and security. One is, Chapter 6 is the Pacific Resolution of Disputes, I think it should be Article 40, 40 something. And then you have Chapter 7, which deals with the enforcement powers of the United Nations. I, do, do you have it clear now? All right, thank you very much. All right, uh, I think we can have Alpha down. All right, um, and, and then we are, uh, it's unfortunate we will not be able to take all the questions because that would mean we'll be here for the rest of the day. Uh, I am being informed that Mr. Fall was not feeling okay the previous days. So he's managed to be with us today. I told him, but he's not worried about extending, but I am worried about his health condition. And I think now I'll just restrict it to the last five. And that would do. So everybody will have last five and that, that's it. Um, I'm sorry, you would want to go longer, but we are worried about your health condition. We can't stretch you any longer than this. Just make it quick. Yes, 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 yes. Good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Fall, um, I have one question and two clarifications. One of the... Um, Clarification I need to ask. My colleague asked and he was answered. But we see there was a time that the Security Council's number have increased. What made it deem necessary to make sure that this Security Council was increased? And the other clarification I want to know. We see the, the League of Nations falls. Um, that lead to the creation of the United Nations. What alternative do the United Nations have to ensure that if they fail in circumstances? Because we see the League of Nations have failed because um, most of their, their agenda was not met. So what alternative did the UN have in case of what uh, their missions failed or what any other crisis? Uh, my question is, uh, we have seen... Yes, my, this is my question. The other was clarification. Yes, my question is, we see the, the, 30, uh, the, 20, the 33 UN president, Harry Trum says, the United Nations is designed to make possible lasting freedoms and independence for all members. Do you think this will come to a day? I didn't hear that. Okay, I said uh, the 33 U.S. President Harry Trump said the United Nations is designed to make possible lasting and freedom independent for all members. Do you think this will come one day in your analytical criticism about the United Nations? Thank you. Uh, 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 thank you very much. Uh, I think the last question uh, dealt with the issue of decolonization. And I think uh, most countries have been decolonized by now. Uh, if there are still a few that are fighting for self-determination, I think there are a few. Uh, Western Sahara is one, just around the corner. Uh, uh, so and I'm not aware of many more, really, which are fighting for independence arising out of traditional colonization. So, so in that regard, I think we have succeeded quite significantly in ensuring independence of a lot of countries. But by this, I mean political independence. If you have in mind economic independence, we're talking about something completely different. And economic independence should be our ideal and not just political independence. But this is more a discussion for some other day. Uh, increased membership of the Security Council is just born out of necessity. Uh, states are still clamoring for greater voice 
in the Security Council or the elimination of the uh, of the of the of the veto veto power. Because really, if two countries, are, two sovereign states, are members of the United Nations, why should one country be given the power to overrule a decision of the Security Council? That unfairness in, by itself has necessitated the need or the clamor for reform. But also, uh, there are other voices that are asking for reform of the United Nations, especially the United States. They spend a lot of money in the United Nations and they don't think that they are getting the reward. Uh, that is, uh, they're not getting uh, a, uh, a big enough bank for the money that they are putting in. But remember that the UN contribution is based on certain parameters, uh, like per capita. So it's based on economic power. Countries like Gambia, we contribute very, very little. So, so, so that is why, you know, reform is very difficult. We are not putting in much money, but we want to have the same equal vote with them. All right? Well, there is this theory, one country, one vote. But also he who pays the piper calls the tunes. So which way do you go? So that is why reform of the UN can be, can be very difficult. But, uh, I mean, where it matters, at the General Assembly, every country is sovereign and every country has one vote. It is only at the Security Council where you have the veto power among certain five permanent members. And hopefully someday this would change. Uh, I think I have answered both your questions. Thank you. All right. Um, we will take a question from Ibrahim Ajata. One question, make it brief. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ibrahim Ajata. I was a student under the Department of Diplomacy and International Relations, now a student of the University of Uganda, majoring in political science. Now, this is my question, Mr. Fuad. I want to understand that conflict begins with an individual. But in order for that conflict to be a full-blown conflict, there must be participants. Now, reflecting back on the opening words of the UN Charter, see, uh, the UN Charter says that we, the people of the United Nations, determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war that we twice in our lifetime had brought control sorrow to mankind. I want to know the UN of today, how is it representing and how is it resembling that opening words of the Charter? This has been the main thrust of this lecture, uh, to show that the UN has been tasked with some lofty ideas, but that the UN has been struggling to meet those lofty ideas. I said at the beginning that this was the mantra of the UN, right? to save successive or existing generations from the scourge of war. That was its main mission. And that its successes or failures should be judged on the basis of how far it has achieved this particular mandate. And then I have showed you instances where it has succeeded and areas where it has failed and why. And I have showed you that the UN has, con has continued to strive to retool and to repeat and to, to, to re-engineer itself in a way that it will be able to deliver on its mandate. I have told you about the major project that was undertaken by Kofi Annan in early 2000, led by, uh, uh, by uh, uh, Lahda Brahimi, uh, former foreign minister of Algeria, who, uh, who led the panel of UN experts to try to examine the UN and try to help reshape it so that it could be more effective in ensuring international peace and security. I have told you about some of the recommendations by the Brahimi Commission, by the Brahimi panel ladder, which were implemented, especially on the issue of integrated components of peacekeeping and so forth. But I have also told you uh, that the UN did not stop at that. It has still continued to look for means to adapt to changing situations. 
and I have told you about the steps that have been taken by the current Secretary General Guterres in by forging greater cooperation and coordination with regional institution, uh, organizations, but also with international financial institutions such as the World Bank and so forth. And some of the steps that are really taking to make the UN more responsive to the ideals that are contained in the, in the Charter. Uh, I, I guess I, I, uh, that is the main thrust of the lecture. So the UN is continuing to strive to achieve those objectives. Sometimes it makes it, it works well, sometimes it fails. But that is the way it is. It's constantly trying to change the international architecture to make it more responsive to the needs of uh, international peace and security. Thank you. All right. Um, I think we'll leave the question and answer session on that. I know personally, if any one of you would have an engagement with him, it would be hours and hours of discussion. And there is no way we can finish all the questions. It's unfortunate that um, some of you might not be able to ask your, your questions, but I think we'll need to proceed on with the rest of the, the program so that we also give him some opportunity to, to recover. We can't afford to overstretch him. And maybe perhaps if we overstretch him, we will not have him again. Next, we'll have a vote of thanks, um, Mr. Abdullah Alamin. Thank you very much for honoring me to be one of the concluding elements of the show. Thank you very much. I'm hereby thanking the entire MDI staff for facilitating this fruitful and insightful event that has really fortified um, the department and the MDI as a whole in such a critical and contentious topic. I'm also thanking all the students that are here, present, um, who have um, helped in making this event a reality. Thank you. Last but not the least, I'm here by thanking Mr. Fall and his entire team in their efforts to deliver this memorable and inspiring lecture in thorough circumspection. You have enlightened us in transiting the theoretical aspects we are learning in the classroom to the practical aspects you've attained in your experiences at the United States, at the United Nations. Being such a high bro in the field, on behalf of the students, we are hoping that um, this will be the last public lecture we'll receive from you. We will, um, we will always be glad to have you in our midst to siphon your knowledge in, and experience in also other topics in the United Nations system. Um, thank you very much. All right, um, thank you very much. Very short and, and precise. So um, to the last part of the, of the ceremony would be some certification at least to recognize your effort as, as well as something that you might be able to keep to remember us for many, many more years to come. And, and like he has said, we hope we will have you again on perhaps a topic of your choice, uh, anything that you feel is, is important that could be discussed here. Not necessarily around the United Nations, but anything that you think might be, might be important. And I think to cap it, you have given us assurance that you will get us the old man here, Dr. Sisi. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'll, I'll call on the head of the department, Madam um, Pulondao, to present a certificate to Mr. Esa Mbaifal. All right, so we will, we will call on the Director of Human Resources Management Development Institute, Madam Sukegei, to help my able HOD in giving the certificate. <laughs> this is the little we can do to appreciate your time, your effort, your energy, and as well as the resources you have spent. Um, for example, you bought fuel to come here. <laughs> um, we, we are really very much appreciative of, of coming here to share um, some time with us, despite your very, very busy schedules. Right. So um, that would cap it for today's public lecture. All right. But thank you very much um, for coming to grace this um, occasion, especially those of you uh, who are not within the Department of Diplomacy and International Relations. Some of you coming from the University of the Gambia, or some of you who might have seen it on WhatsApp, or on Facebook, um, or other social media dongles, and then you decided to come around and grace this occasion. 
we are really appreciative of, of your effort. And thank you very much. Yo, not transfer us. Yeah, transfer us. Ha, code ni enjoy. Okay. What's that? ID sort of. Ha, ha, sort of. Sorry. I get it. Bilang bro. Alba. Alba. Barang Allah sabi sort of ya. Ha, barang kijan dan kuno barang karya. Ah, jangan mewana forest de biru. Gambia tongkon dalam barang biru. Ha, 
56 branches more of the Gambia. Ah, Gambia Kono and in Gambia Bantala Bangu. Kono Kia Bedet Kodo Sifa Sifa for Falindu of Fanya did after Memmen of Kodi Topoton in Kodi Maro. Janum number one in Yonda. And Numfana Nata another enterprise is Sotali. Golam Nintuko, Domoro Fanam Kol Fanam Bay Fidali, the Daddy Man in Domoro Fanam Betiat. Gambia Dauda Yalom of Fakindol Sotali. Ah, one more hat. Apparently, I'm not going to have to yell and candle every night. Yale Bukanin of Kol, Abaraka, Yalon del Chosano. Abaraka. We live in a day and age where technology is creating a world without borders, filled with unlimited potential to improve the lives of the people around us. InnovaRex Global Health ushers in a new way of leveling the playing field with increased access to quality healthcare services delivered at your doorstep. Our qualified professionals are equipped with state-of-the-art point-of-care testing technology to conduct tests such as kidney function, liver function, electrolyte tests, body composition, hemoglobin, A1C, and many more services with the highest efficiency in delivering results. The addition to our flagship Wellness on Wheels, more fondly known as WOW Delivery Service, brings the entire clinical experience full circle. IGH has remained committed to creating the future of healthcare delivery. Gone are the days of sending loved ones outside the country for basic medical services. Innovarex Global Health offers a new peace of mind and takes pride in delivering the quality of care we all deserve. When we touch down, but I broke down. Yamtel G Fiber, now you can enjoy super fast internet in gigabytes. G Fiber is affordable, stable, secured, and accessible to homes, businesses, and enterprises. With Gamtel G Fiber, the future is speed. Gamtel, creating a brighter future in communication.